Hello, everyone. Welcome to This Isn't Working. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Sean. And this week we are talking about uh, mental health in the workplace. This is our uh, part two of, of two parts. So we're going to wrap things up today with some solution-oriented conversation that we'll get into in a minute. But first, Sean has a work fact for us this week. Okay, so this work fact is not solutions-oriented at all. If anything, this was this is what my solution was in the moment. And I guess it makes sense because we're going to be talking about things that don't work shortly. But yeah, so we were in a... We had a group chat and when we worked together, if you recall, um, you, mm-hmm. me, and our supervisor. And I was having one of those just like bad days where I was like pissed off at everything. Yeah. And we've poked fun at our former organization's, you know, departmental divisional values and how ridiculous oh, yes. they were. And so I made a comment about we we were we had been told something that was kind of like we it made us feel like an afterthought. Um, and I can't remember the exact conversation, but it was last summer. I remember that cause it was warm out. Um, and so I said something back, um, referencing one of our values, which was inclusive. And I was like, well, we weren't included and in this sort of thing. So the response I got back was pretty snarky. Like, well, this is us telling you now. And you know, being included, it was, it was a conversation about marketing, I think actually. Oh, okay. Um, and I was like, well, if you had included us in the conversation, you know, whatever. I, I can't remember the exact nature of the conversation. I probably blocked it from my memory. The response I got back was, I, I just basically was like, F it, I'm out. So I walked out of my house and like left. I just left work. Not lunchtime. I just went for a drive. I was furious. And I was like, this is the stupidest thing. I came back. I started painting. I probably didn't work for a good hour and a half or maybe two hours. Like I was that mad um at the conversation and like that was just a result of everything that we were kind of dealing with anyways yeah just kind of a the straw that, that was the trigger yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that was the one that set me off i guess in a way that was a solution it wasn't a good solution it's never a good solution to just like walk out of your job but i mean we were working from home and nobody noticed obviously yeah <laughs> yeah because i didn't even know about this yeah, no, I, I wouldn't. I didn't tell anybody because I, I was just so mad. But if I had stayed, like, I would have for sure thrown like a little hissy fit or a temper tantrum because I was so, so angry at that particular situation. But, you know, more importantly, the, the, the larger circumstances. So, yeah, don't recommend doing that um, in normal circumstances. But, um, you know, those those were extraordinary circumstances in my mind, you know, given what we were experiencing at that job. Yeah, it was all pretty extreme. And I mean, I don't, I mean, like, yeah, you're right. It's not great to walk out in the middle of the workday. Um, right. But it's definitely a good strategy to, like, take a beat, to, like, separate yourself from what's making you feel, like, emotional yeah. and upset. So, like, that, it's still, like, a decent strategy overall for dealing with something. Yeah, I guess that part of it was probably responsible to kind of, like, take a step back. But yeah. I think the the amount of step back I took was probably a little bit excessive, like just stop working for two hours. And there's probably a better way to do it. So I guess I'm, I'm like a little bit torn. I mean, I definitely probably would have done the same thing in hindsight uh, because the alternative was me like blowing a gasket, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think like in that regard, it was smart to, to take a step back, but I probably could have executed a little bit differently, you know? Some things that we'll talk about are things that have worked for us or things that maybe we would change or whatever and how right. we handled things in terms of our solutions. Because these aren't exactly, you know, one-to-one problem solution for kind sure. of things. Which now it feels like a good time to kind of take a look back at the last episode, get everybody reminded about what we were discussing in the quote-unquote sort of problems section of this conversation. So we discussed uh, general problems in the workplace, things that can be problematic on a day-to-day basis uh, or frustrating to deal with. A lot of times as you were experiencing in this particular story, those things can really add up and they can make for a bad day or a longer term bad time. We also talked about things that we may have experienced. So kind of specific stories about different ways that those recurring problems kind of have come up for us in the past how our problems from our personal lives can bleed over into our professional lives or vice versa, um, and how that, even if we try to keep those things separated, a lot of times they're just, you really can't, because as we've said many times, we are humans and we are complicated and, you know, you can't fully separate everything out. 
And then, as we said, this part will focus on kind of solutions. So we'll be talking again about things that don't work generally in terms of mental health in the workplace. Inspirations are stories that we've heard from others about maybe things that have gone well. Uh, we'll talk more about our own experiences as well, how we might handle situations in the, that we've experienced in the past a little bit differently as we've grown and changed and gotten a little more comfortable having some more mental health awareness in the workplace. I actually am going to kick this back to you pretty quick in terms of the things that don't work, because I know you have some some thoughts on on these, but things that at least Tiffany and I have found that don't always work are like certain wellness initiatives. I get the spirit behind like company wellness initiatives and usually they're HR driven. And I think there's a couple of reasons that companies do them. One, it can improve the costs that they pay in terms of like health insurance and those yeah. types of things, and even potentially their liability. It's always better to have a healthy workforce. They are more productive. So I get that sort of aspect of it. But um, we're looking specifically at the physical wellness things because obviously the physical and mental health can be very, very much connected. Like smoking cessation programs. Um, anyone who knows me personally knows I'm an ex-smoker. I smoked for eight years, like 18 to 26. I didn't realize it was around. that long. Yeah, I, I started smoking pretty much like the minute I left for college. Actually, I think maybe even the summer before. I can't remember. It's hard to put, put a, a date on it. But yeah, so I, I was really interested in that program initially because I had tried to quit smoking about six or seven times before I actually quit quit. Oh, really? Yeah, and they always are like, you're going to fail your first one, two, three times. And it was very true, you know, like I give it up for a couple of days and then, you know, whatever. But anyways, that, that aside, I was like, maybe I should try it because I read about it and it was like half physical, half mental. Like they talk about why you smoke. And for me, like, obviously there was a nicotine addiction there. Right. <laughs> That's a bad question. But it was also the habit. That was probably the hardest part because like I would physically go somewhere else to smoke because none of my friends really smoked. And, yeah. you know, I didn't smoke indoors or anything like that, which made me like a super outlier in terms of like targeted population for smokers. So like that was a hard habit to break because, you know, rain or shine or, you know, sun or snow, I was out like going to have a smoke. But it was at a really inconvenient time. Like uh, it was supposed to be at a... It was, a, it was a once a week or every other week for like eight weeks, I think, or 12 weeks. It happened to be during a standing meeting that I couldn't miss for work. Mm. So it was like a work sponsored program, but I couldn't attend because I couldn't reorganize this multi-person meeting. It was like a cross departmental meeting. And I was like, I can't, couldn't be like, hey guys, can we reschedule this entire meeting? Because I have to go quit smoking. Oh, um, so I just never attended. And that kind of sucked because I thought it was going to be more like an online pro, like do it at your own pace. And yeah. yeah, it'd probably be better to like do it with other people and like buddy system or whatever. But sure. it just made me think, and I know you've thought this as well, like who who is this program for? Is it for like older people? Is it for like, I don't know who can make the time. Is it for people who have less busy work schedules? Like, it was just frustrating because that was the only option and the program was only offered once a year. It was only offered once a year? Yeah, once a year, once a semester, I think. I can't can't fully recall, but it was not like a like a regularly occurring thing. You couldn't just join at any point. You had to sign up and start from the get go. For people who work in higher education, like summer probably would have been better when we tend to have fewer meetings, but Yeah. That's even more useless than I imagined. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was not super helpful um, and not very well advertised. Uh, but I know you have some thoughts on like the step counter programs or weight loss programs those, yeah. or just any type of physical wellness programs in general. Yeah. So similar to the smoking cessation, just anything that I don't know, like superficially encourages health and wellness feels like almost kind of a mockery of it to me. So in the same way that they're like, oh, working here, a benefit to you is that we'll help you stop smoking, but only at the times and dates that we find convenient for us. And right, right. <laughs> so again, it's like, who is this for? Like, what good is it doing? And I don't, I don't know anybody that's participated in these kinds of wellness programs with gusto <laughs> that has like good things think I do either, yeah. to say about them, whether it be the smoking cessation or there are always like weight loss incentives, which I, uh, 
I just have a lot of feelings about that. I don't think that it's really necessarily appropriate for the workplace to be like poking around in how much you weigh and why. I understand, yeah. uh, as you said, on a base level, healthier, happier employees can do more and better work. And like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm on board for people taking control of their health in the way that they see fit or in the way that is recommended course, by right. their medical professionals in their lives or whatever. But and I think that it would be good if workplaces made those kinds of, I don't know, changes in support available. But it, I don't know. I just don't think that what's happening is really very functional. There are also, I think, sort of like social pressures to joining these because sometimes I don't know if you remember, but there was like some kind of like bike to work event or something mm-hmm. yep. that the organization did or supported like once a summer or something like that. I've worked at places where there has been like a, you know, take a walking meeting day or something like that. Right. Where you just try to, you know, like there's a little friendly competition involved or whatever. But then I think that some people that maybe just don't want to do that either because they're not interested in it or maybe they have like a physical limitation and they can't do those certain things or whatever. It's a way to make people feel kind of bad about not participating in the group health effort. And like for the biking thing, yeah, if I lived really near the organization, I would have biked to work every day, but I lived you know, a 35 minute drive away. I, I'm not about to bike that. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I mean, I lived a mile and a half from work and I, I don't own a bike, but I definitely didn't do that. I definitely didn't bike to work at all, which in hindsight, I probably should have, or like even walked because it's a very walkable situation. But when you're wearing a shirt and tie and it's like 90 degrees outside in the yeah. summer, it's just not a pleasant experience. But the other problem with those types of things, too, is that any, like, healthy habits are habits. Like, you, yeah. They're reoccurring. You build them up over time, and you incorporate them into your life in sustainable ways. So these one-off kind of, like, everybody bike to work for a week. It's like, yeah, I, I think that's a great idea in, in the spirit of it. But, like, how many people are really going to bike to work indefinitely? You exactly. Know? There's undoubtedly a a, a benefit or like good reasons for doing these things, even if they are one-offs. But as you're, as you pointed out, the, the problem is that, you know, healthy habits have to become habit to be really impactful for anyone. If you have a day where you eat all healthy things, that's not going to change your overall health. If, you know, all the other days you're eating junky food or whatever, and I'm not here to judge people for eating junky food. Uh, if you looked in my pantry right now, you would be judging me, I'm sure. <laughs> Conversely, it's true as well. If you regularly eat fairly healthy and then have like a day a week where you just eat terribly, like that's that day is not going to impact your overall health in the way right. that you think it is. I feel like it's sort of the spirit is good. And I'm kind of behind the concept of, again, like, yeah, we should support each other to be, you know, our best selves in and out of the workplace. But I just don't think that what's happening is really useful at all. And once again, we're going to be, here's, here's an HR trash trigger <laughs> warning. <laughs> we, we would like to reiterate that this is not like an HR slander podcast, but we know that we're not doing a very convincing job of that, but we swear. <laughs> but it just feels like, you know, what's the, what's the motive behind some of these initiatives? As you said, you know, is it actually for the overall health and wellness of the people employed at a given organization? Or is it for reducing their own premium costs? Or I'm is it... pretty sure it's the latter. Like yeah. it's the, the financial cost and the productivity impact that, you know, a work, healthy workforce can have. I'm, I, I'm pretty confident. That, and I don't mean like individual HR professionals are making that call, but I think that's the, that's the you know, the top down sort of like implement all these programs and like that that's what HR leadership type people or company leaders are having in the back of their mind. We focus a little bit more on sort of these like one off initiatives or like short term kind of programs. But I've even had experiences where these like more health and wellness conscious features of benefits or things like that, that HR is kind of, I don't know, like making known or making available or looking more into I think that those can also be really ineffective, (laughs) even if they are geared to be longer term. So I've had a program with my HR that like is extremely inexpensive 
and it's uh, largely online based. It's got an app and everything, and you can opt into it as part of your benefits. And as I said, it's it's really inexpensive. It's like 10 bucks a month. So I was like, oh, I'll give this a try because there was access to, it was very specifically uh, like mental health, kind of like overall health and wellness support, but then also dermatology. Like those were the three features of this particular like plan that you could opt into. Yeah. Especially since dermatology. That's an interesting one. Okay. I'm guessing it's maybe because those are like hard specialists to get into or like maybe have long waits yeah. to actually see someone, which I have experienced um, in both of those professions. So I'm guessing that that's why. But I also thought that it was like very strange that it was specifically those two things. And so I opted in because I thought, well, it would be great to have easy access to those things. And it was so complicated. I tried really hard to use it for weeks, but you had to like set up an account on the app. And then for each of those features that it helped you focus on, each of those features had like its own separate platform. So they were kind of centralized on the app, but you actually had to create accounts and usernames and everything for each of those individual like areas of focus that you wanted to participate in. And then when you were trying to schedule a virtual appointment with a healthcare professional, you basically just like put in some dates and times that worked for you from like a drop down list, essentially. Like you just like mm-hmm. scrolled and you were like, ah, oh, this date, uh, two o'clock or whatever. Total stabs in the dark. And then you would be emailed if the health professional you had selected was available on those three random dates and times that you picked. And if they weren't, uh, it was like, sorry, that doesn't work. Try again. And you had to go through this like 15 question self-assessment to be able to get back in to request an appointment. But at no point did you actually see any availability of any healthcare professional. You literally were just throwing times out there. So I did this like four or five times. Never, never got an appointment that worked. Well, that would make too much sense if they showed you their availability and allowed you to select, you know, one or two of those times. Or right. That doesn't make any sense. Again, that's a great idea. And it's nice that it's really affordable and it should make things easier. But the way that it functions is completely unusable. Terrible execution. And I think that is the case for a lot of HR wellness offerings, especially when, you know, obviously this existed prior to COVID, but during COVID, telehealth and all those types of Mm -hmm. like online whatever programs you know, are becoming more prevalent, you kind of have to like sift through what is being offered and kind of navigate it yourself. Yes. I don't know how well um, the benefits side of HR does. And I remember what, anytime we'd have a new benefit at work, we'd get like an email, which when we worked together was notorious for being the worst way to get a hold of people. (laughs) Right. Constantly over, over emailed. But I feel like a lot of these wellness offerings are being kind of like outsourced in a way um yeah to different apps and online tools and we had a bunch that was different were difficult to use when we worked together and since then i've had difficulty with certain online app type things it feels like a wellness checklist like oh have digital access to mental health for your employees check but the right. quality of those things is yeah laughable. it is much to be desired for yeah. sure in terms of things that we've heard from others and this could be like things we've seen in the news uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to reference a couple things that I've seen on LinkedIn. If you look at our TikTok, you will see me slander this, this person who made one of these like employee wellness, like how to prevent them from quitting posts. And I absolutely slandered the, no, like no disrespect, the president of Temple University because he made an absolutely ridiculous LinkedIn post about it. It's on the, this isn't working TikTok, which you can see. But one of the things that he put on his ridiculous post And it's ridiculous because they don't actually offer these things to their employees. So just a side note there. But he referenced mental health days or shutdowns, which isn't a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And as you and I have talked about, that's kind of included in sick time or PTO, or at least we think it should be. Yeah. I I don't know if it actually, if people always view it that way. Um, I know we've talked about like having difficulty deciding like, should I take today off because I don't feel well? Like, yeah. mentally? It's like the same as having like the flu or a cold or something. Like, I, I can't work very well today. Should I just take the day off? And so I see people trying to introduce more of these organization wide, like one, two, or even week long shutdowns. I've seen a couple major companies do it. A lot of companies seem to do, because we're in the US, 
um, the time between Christmas and New Year's because mm. it's pretty widely recognized holiday season. So I, I see that becoming more common, which I think is good to have everybody kind of disconnect for ideally a full week. Yeah. Because if you take a day off, you're going to spend the next three days of your life freaking out about catching up or yeah. what you missed or the the fear of getting even further buried, which will ultimately impact your mental health. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even like missing school as a kid was so stressful for me. I was like, it makes more yeah, sense for me to go to school feeling sick and fluey and not miss anything and just like try to power through than it does for me to take a day off or two and fall that far behind. And I have always kind of had that mentality and I think that it is trash. I do not want that mentality because it's not healthy. No, it's a terrible mentality. No, because it applies to vacations as well and yes. things like that. We should be able to take time off when we need it. Yeah, I feel better when everybody else is off as well because then I'm less worried about what I've missed. Or yeah. More, not so much what I missed, but what I will have to do when I get back because that's always stressful. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's so hard to disconnect that, and that's part of how our personal and work lives kind of bleed into mm-hmm. each other. Even when I've been on vacation, I'm – very good now about like taking that time for myself. But often if I am like in an airport or I find myself up a little early in the morning or something, I'll go into my work email and delete like, you know, those like announcements that won't matter or like reports that come in or whatever, just to kind of clear out my inbox because it stresses me out to come back to like hundreds of emails. Thousands of, yeah. Especially when I know that like 70% of them, I am not going to need to really engage with at all. Or they're just like something I've been copied on and I need to just like read through right. it and then I'm caught up or whatever. So I yep. I will sometimes do that. And I, I try not to even do that because I'm like, you know, I should be like vacation time is vacation time. Work time is work time. Yes, that's that's a very good point. Uh, and and I, I'm also getting better at doing that. But that that's also been sort of challenging. Then you have the sort of situations where you don't even really have the opportunity because you may be expected to have a, a work phone or to have work-related things on your phone. And that's why we've seen, I don't know if we've really seen, sometimes we'll see like individual states or localities do it in the U.S., but I don't know if I've seen any, but this right to disconnect type legislation that we've seen primarily in European countries, mm-hmm. I think France and Germany have some version of it where your employers can't contact you after business hours, you know, for like work-related matters, yeah. those, those types of things. I think some Scandinavian countries have it um, or some, some sort of version of it. And, and probably elsewhere in the world, but obviously in, in sort of the usual suspects in, in Northern and Western Europe. On the one hand, it's great that they're doing that, of course, because it helps to have those strict boundaries enforced on a larger scale. But on the other hand, it's also like a little bit sad that we have to do that and we aren't just kind of like doing it naturally and again, kind of letting oh, yeah. people be people and, and understanding that, you know, at five o'clock or four o'clock or whatever time you get done, like that's it for the day. That's you're you're done. <laughs> Yeah, a federal legislation in the U.S. like that would never would never happen, and I I can't even either party no. you know jumping <laughs> on board with that you know, um so it's really up to individualized companies to your point to kind of define that or you know they might have their own policies and I've seen some companies the the best companies and job postings and their company values I've seen you know, articulate, this is how we help you achieve work-life balance rather than just say like, we have great work-life balance. Yeah. All right. Then don't email me at nine o'clock at night saying that you need my attention immediately, you know? Right. (laughs) But I do understand that the goal is to have a more defined work-life balance, but you're right. It is sad that we have to even try and legislate that into, into being. Yeah, it is. But it's, I mean, if that's what works, then I'm all for it. Again, I don't, I don't see that happening here anytime Mm -hmm. soon, possibly ever. But um, it's good to have a model of that somewhere in the world, at least. Yes, I I do agree. And hopefully that, you know, integrates itself into company cultures elsewhere, even if they're not legislatively mandated to do so. Yeah, agreed. So another thing that we've seen that has worked for people uh, that we've heard good things about are employee assistance funds or employee assistance programs. Those can be really beneficial. I know that I have used employee assistance program offerings uh, at various jobs for, again, normally access to mental health, to be honest, because it can be so difficult to get it otherwise and so confusing. But it's helpful to have something like that set up to be at least a guide. 
Yeah, I agree. And and one thing that we had, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, um, when we worked together, is a professor won this award, and there's there was a, a monetary thing with it. But she donated the funds back into this employee assistant fund program. And there were some stipulations on it, um, income limit, the amount you could, it was like an interest-free loan of anywhere, like up to $500 maybe. So oh, it's for okay. like emergency things like an emergency car repair or emergency childcare, those types of things where you need like basically access to, to quick cash and you yeah. don't have it. Two things that I always thought of. One, great idea, I think, you know, to have totally. those because... I mean, as we know, like, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but something, an absurd number of Americans can't afford like a $400 emergency expense or something yeah. like that. I, can, I don't I know the number the, either, but it is, it is jaw dropping. It's alarmingly high. high yeah. yeah. In that sense, it's great. On the second, you know, side of things, maybe we should pay people more. Like, <laughs> Maybe what? the organization should pay people more An so idea. they have like a savings, uh, can have a nest egg. So I think it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think it's a good thing, but, it, you know, it there's it's like when you see those heartwarming stories of, like, a child who's paid off his classmate's lunch debt. It's like, uh, okay, so that's good that, right. that they don't have lunch anymore, but, like, why does a nine-year-old have debt? <laughs> right. This is not a. This is not the feel-good story. The headline. Yeah, it's not heartwarming. Is pushing. Um, it's actually pretty dystopian. So it, it gave me those kind of vibes. So like, I don't want to belittle the program or like, you know, belittle helping people in need because that's not what I'm trying to say at all. It's indicative of larger, you know, societal issues that Absolutely. one individual employee assistance program is not going to solve. But, you know. There shouldn't be a need for these types of programs. It's the same spirit of like starting to go fund me so you can afford your cancer treatment. So like that's dystopian. And anyone who thinks that's heartwarming is, you know, deranged. The last sort of thing that obviously we know works, which is PTO, which includes sick time. So I know some organizations just do like one lump, you know, this is your PTO yeah. bucket. Some have like separate work, uh, excuse me, vacation and sick time. Yeah. I think that's a little bit less common these days. But, you know, it just kind of organizes. There's, I mean, there's no um, legislation in the U.S. that mandates any sort of sick time or any paid time off, to my knowledge. Um, so it's it's really up to the individual company. I know if you're a listener abroad, and I know we have some, that that concept is probably a little bit unusual to you because your country, more likely than not, has some sort of mandated time off period. I can't remember what it is in the U.K. I think it's like 20 days or something. Mm-hmm. But PTO should include you know, things like mental health sick time, because yeah. sick time is sick time is sick time, you know, whether it's physical, mental, or spiritual, I guess. I don't, I don't know. What, <laughs> I don't know what that would look like, but I'll allow it. I don't think you really need to justify why you're taking sick time. I think I feel the need to say this, and this is a bit of a side note, because every time we propose something in this country in particular that would better workers or better the general citizenry, like, is well-being, Somebody immediately goes to, but what about the people who will abuse it? It's like when people talk about, um, you know, people who use social welfare in the U.S. Oh, yeah. Of course, there's instances of fraud and people who abuse it. But those cases are so, so rare. And so it's so such a bureaucratic process to even get access to societal benefits, social welfare in the U.S. Um, that it's just not even worth it <laughs> yeah. to go through all that. If you don't have to. I, I always feel the need to, like, acknowledge that. And like shut down that argument from the get go because it's a ridiculous argument. Agree. I, I do know that, you know, in some some industries, particularly I'm thinking of when I, I worked at a restaurant and this is probably the case in retail, you had to have a, a doctor's note if you miss work for being sick. Oh yeah. I think is a little bit strange because not all well, for two reasons. One, our healthcare system is a joke. And two, not all illnesses warrant medical attention. No. Like if you have Absolutely not. If you have a cold, like a a serious cold or like a head cold or something or a migraine, like you don't necessarily need to go to a doctor for that. Right. You just might not be able to work. And also, do you want your employee coming in and handling food if they're sick? You know, like the answer is no. It's just strange. But the the point is to we don't really need to differentiate between mental health sick time and physical sick time because sick time, sick time, sick time. (laughs) Yes. Any time that you are unable to perform your job for mental or physical health reasons that should fall into PTO. And I think that people are more open to that in terms of taking that time or taking a mental health day. Like I personally have taken mental health days, but I don't, 
say that that's what's happening. I just know that that's sure. like what's best for me. And I'm, you yeah. know, I'm not like, I've never needed to take like more than a day, but there are just like times when like, I'm not sleeping well because I'm really stressed and then I like can't really focus and I'm not doing good work then it, it would be better to right. just yeah what are you gonna do show up and do t- a terrible job right and, like that's gonna push make things even worse exactly but I I don't it's never been explicitly stated to me that that's allowed so I've never made clear that that's what I'm doing either it's sort of a you know um, better to ask forgiveness than permission kind of thing is how I've always kind of looked at it. I don't think you need to. Do you want your employer and your personal medical history that no. we're like, uh, yeah. So, and I mean that I don't need, you know, my employer to know every single thing. I do the same thing with like physical illnesses industry. as well. I mean, everybody is kind of same, yeah. up in everybody's health business now with COVID. Like people are very upfront yeah. about like that experience at least, or specifically right. stating like, it's not COVID it's this or whatever. Um, but I have like really bad seasonal allergies and there are times where I have just like such a head cold that I absolutely like, I can't look at a screen. I can't think I can't breathe. And I'm just like, I can't, like, I don't have it in me today, but I don't distinguish that either. I don't say like, I have allergies. I'm taking the day off. I just say like, I'm unwell. I will be using a sick day. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's sort of to transition into things that have worked for us. You know, we we now compared to in the past do take time off when necessary. Yeah. Would it be, and and as I'm saying this, I do recognize that not everybody in the U.S. has access to any sort of paid time off. Yes, absolutely. Um, which is absurd. A again, shame. You know, yeah. Frankly, greatest country in the world. Yeah, <laughs> USA. But when you have the time off, uh, or have the ability to take time off, you and I are definitely more inclined to actually use it. Yeah. Than maybe we would have been previously. Yeah, that hasn't always been the case for me, but the older I get, the more I am like, okay, this is for me to use. It's okay to use it. I don't need to go sit through an exam with the flu yeah. so that I don't miss it or whatever like I did when I was younger or, and even through college. Yeah, I shouldn't feel bad for it either. I mean, like, I think, so t- two things. One, obviously, we've spoken about not really taking it over the last couple of years because we were banking for the payout. Yeah. <laughs> our, our former organization did that. So that's a little bit of a different For vacation, not but... sick time. Correct. Yes. Vacation only. Cause yeah. Our, Cause they did distinguish, distinguish and they would pay out a uh, vacation Dude, accrual. I wish they did. Cause I had like 50 days of sick time. Oh, time same. We, I had so much sick time. Yeah. It's crazy. So then you have the sort of circumstance where you like use it or lose it. So I know some organizations, I think my dad's company does it where you get an allotment for the year. And if you don't use it, then it doesn't roll over. Yeah. And you just kind of lose it. Don't love that. Yeah, I know in my current role, it's it's like that where you get the allotment for the year and then you, you have to have to take it and it's prorated based on, you know, when you when you start. Yeah. So which makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, in that way, it's kind of an encouragement to use it. I think it also just depends on the organization that you work for. I know people who work for non-U.S. companies who operate in the U.S., generally speaking, from a high level, are, are often more times than not encouraged to take it because that's the norm in in their country. Um, Whereas here, you know, if it's a full on American company, people might want you to be available during your vacation time or, you know, by phone or text or even email, um, or it might make you feel some kind of way for taking the time off. But I think largely, and I attribute this in many ways to Gen Z who just aren't taking it anymore. Yes. We love our Gen Zers. Right. I, I think it's just, becoming strongly encouraged for people like just take the time off because realistically like your job isn't your number one priority in your life your life is your priority (laughs) a good story and a bad story about like just you know take the time off so I don't know if you knew this or not but before I got to where we worked together I had worked for organizations that were kind of under the same large umbrella so actually when I moved from Mm -hmm. one to the other I got to move my sick time over that's the only time that's ever happened to me. Oh, right. It was amazing because it's always, it's a little bit stressful if you're starting a new job and starting at zero sick time because you're like, oof, I hope I don't have a dentist appointment lined up or, uh, you know, I like I have a monthly standing doctor's appointment for this one thing or, you know, I already had this mm-hmm. specialist mm-hmm. that I was going to meet. And so like, it can just be stressful. We've talked about the the kind of, because of the way that our private insurance works in this country, how it can be stressful to change jobs and flip things over and make sure that like all of your caregivers are covered by your new plans and things like that. And that you don't get, that you don't have to change them, that you don't get slammed with unexpected bills, et cetera. 
So it was really nice. The one and only time I've gone into a job with a ton of sick time already accrued because I worked at that other place for a while and really didn't use the sick time very much. Um, So that was like super nice to have that on hand. And at the time I was getting allergy shots. And so I, I had to go weekly for those and I would have needed quite a bit of sick time through that. So it was nice to have that cushion from my previous role right. because of the way that those organizations were connected. And then the other thing I was going to say is when you were talking about sort of like um, ex- being expected to be available on your vacation or at least like reachable or whatever, we've talked about this before you and I, I don't know if we've had a conversation about it on the podcast before, but the concept of unlimited PTO and how that is right. like deeply messed up because people feel less yeah. inclined to take something they feel that they haven't earned. Like it's already difficult enough to convince people to take their earned vacation in the U.S. There are a lot of there's a lot of hesitancy and there are a lot of um, ways that organizations make people feel guilty for taking the time that they've earned. So yeah. while unlimited PTO sounds like, you know, the dream um, people who have it, like studies have shown that they actually take less vacation time less. and psychologically yes. part of that is because they feel that they haven't earned it and because it's just given to them. Now, I definitely know people that are like, not that take advantage of the system, but that do, that are like, well, this is their policy. So like, I'm going to take my extra vacation this year or whatever. And like power to them, love that for those people. But the vast majority of people feel like they haven't earned it so they don't they're even less inclined to take it my last job had unlimited pto and i felt very much that way um i i am aware of people who take it but you know your job's not gonna let you take three months off no you know? <laughs> it's just I, so i think you know it, it's difficult i have seen some policies where they have a unlimited pto with a minimum expectation that you take x amount of days um, oh, okay. Which I think is a step in the right direction. Yeah, I like that. I have mixed feelings about unlimited PTO. I think the concept is kind of cool. And yeah, you should be able to take time off when you need it for realistically as much time as you need it. But when you have a specified allotment of PTO, there's going to be limitations to that. It's going to have to be approved, likely by your manager. You can't just take time off on your own whim. In a country like ours where you know time off isn't, viewed as favorably as we might want it to be that you know having unlimited pto i just don't think we're gonna we execute it very well yeah agree who knows maybe maybe it'll it'll work out to be better so i think you know it it becomes incumbent on us to to, again take the initiative to define our own work-life balance when possible yeah we've had problems during the past when i first started when we were together i used to work way over the 35 hours i was scheduled to and I was never asked to, but I just did it because I assumed that that was the expectations or, Same. or the norm of the organization. Yeah, we talked about that in a previous episode where I thought that, you know, I had this new, like, more uh, significant title and a new role and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, like, this is what people in this space do. This is what I do now. I work until 5 instead of 4.30 because I have important things that I need to get done. Yeah, and I guess how you define that is is up to you. I mean, even in my current job, They don't provide you with a company phone, but you're expected to have a phone. So they provide you with a reimbursement every month. Um, You know, it's not super uncommon. Yeah. But I don't want work stuff on my personal device. And I know there's people who love having just one phone and they don't care to have their work email or whatever. It just means they can carry one phone. I am happy to carry two phones if it means that my personal life and my work life are completely separate and data is separate. Because realistically, if you give your company access to have certain apps or the expectation that your device is no longer private because you have company materials on them. Like I don't need people go like, I keep banking information on my phone. Like I have banking apps and you know, those types of things. So what I did to, to help define this was I am taking that reimbursement, that monthly reimbursement. And I just got to add it a line to my phone plan. So I have a completely different phone. Like in a, I just bought a cheap phone. Um, added a line for 20 bucks a month and very much worth it, you know, in my mind to just completely separate those things out. And people might think that's extreme or excessive, but like I have data privacy concerns when it comes to companies and I just don't want to, you know, I've had Slack on my personal phone. I've had email on my personal phone. I've had all these other work related apps on my personal phone and I don't 
like it because I don't want to be have the inclination to look at those things uh, off hours or ha- have get notified of things, you know, because somebody else is working late. I-, I don't want to like those types of things. I think it's healthier if I separate them. I think that's a great solution. I th- I, th- I feel like I that that should be an option that you can opt into having them provide a work phone. I was kind of surprised to hear that you would it think, right? wasn't. Yeah. But honestly, that's been my experience too. It's kind of just the expectation. I do a lot of like app folders on my phone. Like everything's in a folder. Yeah, same. So I just have like a work folder and like I just go I just don't go to that if I'm not working. But I do I mean the privacy concerns are worth looking into more. So I think it's just one of those things like it's when it's po- when possible it's up to us to sort of define that work life balance a little bit more. I mean, this is working for you, obviously. And I think that I've talked in the past about how when we first started working from home, when the pandemic hit, I traded my what used to be my commute time for like some physical activity. So that helped me right. like, mentally create a barrier between like, OK, it's 430. Now I do yoga or now I walk the dog and then I could I had like a hard separation between work hours and home hours, especially since I've worked remote ever since having that hard stop and an activity that I'm mostly just accountable to myself for doing, but making sure that that is very defined for me has been helpful. Of course, uh, there's our favorite way of, you know, taking initiative to define your own work-life balance, which is quitting and getting a new job if you need it. Yes. Always. Again, as we said before, we know it's not as easy as it sounds and we wish it was. But one thing that's healthier that I do, even when I'm happy as I am currently in my my rules that just kind of peruse to see what's out there. Leave on your open to work stuff on LinkedIn. You never know when an opportunity is going to come up. That's better for you. Yeah. Uh, Maybe financially, maybe in terms of what kind of work circumstances or even just the type of work you're doing. Um. I think, you know, it's, it's, we're big proponents of job hopping these days. Um, And, you know, I mean, it's just, I think it's healthy to, you know, understand that you have an option or the ability to leave even when things are going okay, or you're content because what's, what could happen is what happened to to Tiffany and I, where we waited too long um, and we started looking for jobs in the middle of pandemic when things were a little bit crazy. Um, And so we ended up being stuck significantly longer in a situation that we didn't want to be in, um, you know, because we didn't start really actively looking at the at the first sign of 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 chaos. (laughs) Yeah, that's been one of our biggest lessons, I think, in terms of like how to address, I mean, in part mental health, but also just like job satisfaction and all kinds of other things factors about working not just work life but like working life and I think that recognizing when it's time to to really be seriously looking for the door um, has definitely been one of our biggest lessons and something that like we're way more aware of now oh hyper aware I just want to have that option because I don't want to put as you shouldn't with anything in life, put all your eggs into one basket and your work life shouldn't be that way at all. That's for sure how things have changed and how we would handle things differently and how we do handle things differently. I mean, um, you know, uh, the last year we've seen a lot of change in our professional lives in a, in less than a year, really. Oh, yeah. Both of us have experienced significant <laughs> changes in our jobs and professional experiences that we will talk about in future episodes once, once they're a bit more once they're a bit more settled, but it's just funny to think about less than a year ago where we, or a year ago where we were to where we are now. One thing that I like to do that I I did in my last job and I'm doing in this job is just define the, as I've mentioned, sort of like define early on the work-life balance, um, set expectations on what you will and will not do, understand what the expectations are of you, what your goals are, and then act accordingly. So once you've gotten kind of the lay of the land, Define the work-life balance. Be like, okay, I take my lunch hour at this time. It's 30 minutes or an hour, whatever it is. These are my normal working hours, which, you know, might be handed to you by your company. Um, My current role has defined working or business hours, I should say. Uh, My previous role did not have explicitly defined working hours, just kind of like a general try and keep it around this time. Yeah. Um, 
which was fine for me. I know some people might not love having nebulous work hours, <laughs> but it worked fine for me. And, you know, having more defined work hours, totally fine for me as well. And it's incumbent on you because your your company isn't going to necessarily define your work-life balance for you. It's really your your individual responsibility to kind of like lay that out. So that's certainly how we handle these differently now is that we kind of say like, more, we're more upfront with ourselves and it's not some huge announcement you have to make, but just set those boundaries with yourself up front. Yeah. I think it's empowering to like be clear about that instead of being wishy-washy. And I know that I always really appreciate when other colleagues are like, no, I'm done at five. Like if you email me, I'll get it in the morning. That's fine. But like, you should know I'm not going to be looking at email. That is great for me because then one, I don't feel bad about emailing them after hours, especially because I work in a different time zone from a lot of my colleagues. So I may be doing things during my normal working hours that I just like don't want to forget about or that I want them to have at the start of their day, but I start, you know, hours later. And so it's helpful for me because I don't want to be burdening anybody after hours, but I want them to have what they need the next day when they do start up again. And it is helpful as well, because again, people work in different time zones, especially these days with so much more remote work. Yeah. You know, it's funny. This is something that you said to me when we were outlining the episode. We might handle things the same way that we did before. Mm -hmm. You know, like I talked about at the beginning how, you know, I probably wouldn't have handled my walkout <laughs> any differently at the time um, and now even maybe, but that's fine. You know, I mean, you don't have to necessarily do things differently. So I think it's okay to acknowledge that like, we're a work in progress as people uh, professionally as well. So you don't have to, you know, look back on everything and be like, oh, I should have done it this way. And I'm one of those people who very much does that. Looks back and thinks of. Oh, it would have been so much better. Yeah, yeah. I do that quite a lot, too. I try not to do it when it's like really not helpful. But I think that, yeah, in, in creating the outline for this episode, we did talk about like, here are some specific examples that are coming to mind and like. I wouldn't do anything any differently. I'm I'm pleased with how I handled that or how it came about or just the fact that like there's no need to change it. The outcome was fine. The yeah. reasoning was solid, you know, whatever. There's no reason to to feel like you have to make changes or handle things differently if you're already doing some of these things or if you're doing your own things that make sense and work for you. So the last part of this episode really revolves around when is it ever necessary to kind of disclose any sort of mental health challenges you're facing with your boss, with your organization, with your colleagues. Most people, when they apply for a job or start a job, might realize that there's a, a federal form in the mm -hmm. U.S. that you can disclose if you have some sort of disability. It's not supposed to be tied to you individually. It's just for federal Overall statistics, keeping. yeah. Exactly. And there's, a, of course, a lot of physical disabilities on there, but there are also mental health problems, I'll call them, or challenges that technically are, are defined as having disability, including things like depression and anxiety, things that you might not realize are disabling, but they, they certainly can be. So for me, I think I told my supervisor once that like, I was having a lot of mental health challenges and the response I got was like everybody has bad days so it was you know not super helpful so I'm I, I typically don't disclose to my supervisor or colleagues really any of my health history or background or when I'm having health problems I don't think it's necessary I think there are circumstances if you need a like a reasonable accommodation in your workplace where it's okay to disclose to your organization oh totally um but aside from that I don't I don't know if there's really a time when you need it, when it's necessary to, to disclose it, as, as you and I have said in this episode, we don't, when we have to take a day off for health reasons, we don't necessarily specify what those health reasons are because it's not it's necessary. It's nobody's business. <laughs> you don't need to articulate that why. And hopefully you, you don't need a doctor's note to, to bring to your supervisor or boss to prove that you were in fact sick. I think you're right. If Especially if you have like a, I don't know, is it like a protected status or something to that effect where you would potentially be uh, eligible for accommodations that you need to do your job? Definitely like right. have those conversations and get what you need to be able to perform your work. I don't have any disabilities or uh, conditions where any kind of physical accommodation or anything is required. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. I definitely have some some of those like unseen kind of conditions that can impact my ability to 
work, but I'm able to manage those things fairly well. So for me, like, I don't really need to have those conversations. Like a regularly occurring, reasonable accommodation. That, that's certainly different. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for for me personally, I have kind of limited in some cases what I disclose because, again, like, I'm just I'm kind of a more private person and I don't want people in my business. Yes, for sure. But I encourage conversations about like mental health awareness sort of generally. And I I think that more conversation also helps eliminate more stigma. I don't always personally live up to that myself. It's something that I am working on. As you said, we are we are humans. We are works in progress. But I would advise against anyone oversharing just sort of Generally, I I advise against that in all circumstances. Like, think about what you're sharing and does it need to be known by the people you're sharing it with? (laughs) Privacy is important. But I think that especially in work, there's a there's a a way to balance sort of what you share and getting the accommodations that you need, even if it is just like taking a mental health day and just calling in sick, not getting specific about it. Absolutely. Because unfortunately, there could be very real implications for your career you know by just by by sharing too much and and obviously we want people to be honest and transparent but just when when necessary we've also talked about how sean and i are like fairly paranoid about these sorts of things (laughs) but it definitely does happen and it's worth kind of considering as part of your overall i don't want to say strategy because that makes it sound like very i don't know kind of calculating but just your overall willingness to share and what it is that you choose to share. And so we know that this episode and the last one weren't heavy. We promised that they wouldn't, well, they weren't that heavy. We promised that they wouldn't be that heavy when we were talking about this topic, but the next episode will be much more chill and much lighter. Just in general, we peppered in this conversation and throughout the whole podcast, really how things sometimes work in around the world in terms of work culture, benefits, expectations in the workplace. So as we've said previously, Tiffany and I have experiences working abroad. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to talk about some of the things that we've seen, not only in the news, but that we've experienced while working abroad as well. And, and sort of what that looks like. And it'll just be a pretty chill work around the world type episode. Yeah, it's going to be <laughs> a lot of fun. And maybe as you are planning your summer travels or things like that, if you are going to any of these places that we'll mention, it's something you can think about what their work life is like. Don't forget, if you need help or you're having some sort of mental health challenges, for sure ask for help when you need it. And then also just tell us what works for you in managing just the everyday mental health stressors in the workplace because we are all ears for new types of strategies. Yeah, we love to hear what you have to say. And we are still working on a lot of things ourselves. So if you have any hot tips, we are here for it. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.